Hello. My name is Hakushi Hamaoka, as uh, known as Dr. Hama. I have been producing uh, my talk a playlist on YouTube called Towards a Kinder Society. Uh, yeah, I am a PhD in management, uh, specialized uh, in everyday practices social practices and especially mm, I've been interested in morality and uh, today uh, I'm talking about the f one of the most famous science fiction writers H.G. Uh, Wells Actually, I'm not uh, qualified to make some substantive comments on his works, uh, but I, I have just read uh, one of his works uh, titled The Shape of Things to Come. Uh, this is about uh, history written in 2106 yeah obviously this uh, novel was written in uh, written and published in 1933 so this uh, novel mostly consists of this imaginary history written in the future 2106 and uh, yeah the reason why I started reading this is uh, I myself wish to write some fiction which uh, describe or present some uh, images of the world in which the basic universal basic income is realized so if we don't have to work uh, just for subsistence how the world will change Yes, so I'd like to offer some vision so that yeah we may be able to proceed thinking about concretely much more concretely about the scheme of universal basic income which I believe uh, is very um, is needed to for the better development of our society uh, but I as I read this novel uh, the sh shape of things to come I noticed some limitation or Probably uh, many my contemporaries still share the same uh, predispositions, tendencies to believe that our ancestors m may be uh, underdeveloped in comparison to us. So we tend to see the ancient people are less logical, rational, scientific-minded. 
but I was thinking about this uh, almost uncritical assumption could be one of the most uh, problematic characters of present day mankind and uh, today I will introduce a section of this imaginary history book which I think mm, represent represents that conventional imagination about the flow of time probably we continuously uh, developing or progressing from the past to towards the future so probably mm, in the subsequent talks we we take much closer look at this text but today I just uh, go through the, the one of the sections of this imaginary history book so that as many people as possible peruse carefully read this uh, the typical conventional imagination that we are progressing without interruption probably a little bit of interruption but in principle our ancestors are less developed in comparison to us I would like to raise a serious question about this assumption which I believe relates to contemporary problems um, in relation to yeah, my dream of a kinder society yeah I am concerned with the fact that the people especially well endowed people appear to be growing less kind rather than mm, compassionate or mm, inclusive just busy showing off one's own competencies so I think that is really problematic if we want to materialize better society all over the all over this globe so I will just introduce a passage of this HG Wells novel history especially general history is prone to deal too much with masses and outrights we write that all Germany resented an insult or the hopes of Asia fell but the living facts of history are changes in thought 
emotions and reaction in the minds of thousands of millions of lives. One must draw upon the naive materials of one's own childhood to conceive, however remotely, the states of mind of those rare spirits who looked first towards human brotherhood. One must consider the life of some animal, one's dog, one's cheetah, or one's pony, to realize the bounded, definite existence of a human being in the early civilizations. The human life, then, was just as set in its surroundings as any animals. There was the town, the river, the cultivations, the distant hills, the temple, near friends and strange distant enemies constituting a complete and satisfying all. The gods were credible and responsible, taking all ultimate responsibility off your shoulders. The animals had souls like yourself, as understandable as yourself, and the darkness and shadows were haunted by spirits. In that sort of setting, innumerable generations lived and loved and hated and died. Everything was made familiar and understandable by the trick of personification. You brought the stranger into your family. You made it a member of your group. Earth was a mother and a son, a great father of glory marching across the sky. It is a marvelous intricate history to trace how the human mind began to doubt, to pry and question, to penetrate the curtains of assurance and fancied security that engrossed it. Perhaps it was rather torn out of its confidence than that it fretted its way out by any urgency of its own. The Hebrew Bible, which Christianity preserved for us, is a precious record of uneasy souls amidst the limited conditions of these ages before mechanism, or travel, or logical analysis. It tells how man came out of the Eden of unquestioning acceptance and found perplexity. It gives us intimate glimpses of states of mind that were typical of what went on in hundreds of thousands of struggling brains. They were beginning to note thorns and weeds, toil and the insecurity of life. They made great efforts to explain their growing sense that all was not right with the world. They had to dramatize the story. They had as yet only personification as a means of apprehending relations and causes. They had no way of getting hold of a general idea except by imagining it as a person. Strange thoughts frightened them. They seemed exterior to them. They dared not even say, I think. They had to say, I heard a voice or the word of the Lord came to me. Enormous effort therefore was needed to pass from the thoughts of a patriarchal tribal god to a mightier overriding God. Men did not unite communities. They identified their gods. Monotheism was the first form of the world state in men's minds. What a desperate deed it was for some inwardly terrified man to lift up his voice against the local elders and the local idol, proclaiming there is no God but God. The reactions of his attempt to break out to white relations were scorn, amusement, irritation, dislike, or horror and superstitious fear. We have the story of Muhammad recorded and of his fight with the gods of Mecca, but that was a late and sophisticated instance of something that happened in innumerable times and places. The challenge of the man inspired by his new idea to the social mental nest out of which he was breaking. Men who saw the light and spoke were only one species of a larger genus of human beings whose minds worked differently from the common man's or were simply more feverishly active. The others were eccentrics or downright madmen. One thought was hardly to be told from another, 
for both were sayers of incredible things. The beginning of written record in the millennium before Christ shows a long tradition already established for the treatment of these odd, disturbing exceptions. So far as we can peer into the past, we find the tranquility of the everyday community broken by these troubled, troublesome individuals who went about living queerly, saying unusual and disconcerting things, inciting people to behave strangely, threatening divine anger, foreboding evils. There was a disposition to buy them off with a sort of reverence and disregard. Inferior and unhappy people might find an interest and excitement in their strange announcements and suggestions, but rulers did not like them. Comfortable people disliked and feared them. They irritated, they terrified contented people. They seemed perverse, and many of them plainly were perverse. If they went too far, mankind turned on them and they were ill-treated and mobbed and ridiculed. They were cast into prisons, beaten and killed. The ones that mattered most seem always, by our present standards, to have had something to say that was at once profoundly important and yet not quite true or not quite truly said. Disciples, sometimes in great multitude, responded to their enigmatical utterances. When they died or were killed, men were left asking, What exactly did he say? What exactly did he mean? The inspired words became very rapidly riddles for interpreters and matter for pedantry. They were phrased and rephrased, applied and misapplied, tried out in every possible and impossible way. Nowadays we find a common quality in all these madmen, prophets, teachers, and disturbers of the mental peace. The species was learning to talk and use language. The race was, as it were, trying to think something out, was attempting to say something new and enlarging to itself. It was doing this against great resistance. Its intellectual enterprise was playing against its instinctive fear of novelty. Some of these teachers died terribly, were afraid or burned or tortured to death. One hung on a cross and died of physical weakness some hours before the two felons, who were his hardier fellow sufferers, leaving a teaching compound, mm, compounded of such sweet and fine ideas of conduct, such mystical incomprehensibleness, such misleading inconsistency, that it remained a moral stimulus and an intellectual perplexity, a jungle for heresies and discoveries, for millions of souls for two millennia. Vainly does one try nowadays to put, one, put ourselves into the mind of the prophet led to execution. We know the value of what he did, it is true, but what did he think he was doing? The secret of such personifying, urgently seeking brains seem hidden from us now forever. In the busier and more prosperous social phases of history, such disturbers are less evident. In times of change, and especially when there was also a release of social energy, when conflicting traditions ground and war upon each other, these troubled and troublesome minds seem to have multiplied. The days of the vast unstable Roman imperialism abounded in efforts to say something new and profound about life. Everywhere there were new worships, because a worship still seemed the only form in which new idea and way of life could be conveyed from mind to mind. Everywhere the puzzled, sprawling human race was trying to say something, some magic word to resolve its perplexities and guide it to peace. The renaissance, renaissance of learning and the onset of organized science, the actual number and the actual proportion of inquiring and innovating minds increased greatly. 
the effort of the racial mind to master the conditions of its being was renewed on a multitudinous scale. But now the disturbers of equanimity no longer appear as wide-eyed prophet. They no longer claim that the world of the Lord is upon them. Abstract and logical thought has pervaded the mind of the race and such personification is no longer needed. They do not denounce the old gods, they analyze them. Moreover, now that we approach modern times and deal with more and more abundantly recorded events, we begin to realize with a living understanding and sympathy what was going on in the minds of the innovators and to feel it touch feel in touch with the immeasurable heroisms and innumerable tragedies of those later pioneers, those rebels, critics, revolutionaries who were thrusting more or less intelligently against the acceptances and inertias amidst which they lived towards a saner, more comprehensive and more clearly apprehended racial idea. So far no completely mastery digest has been made of the millions of biographies and tons of other materials that tell of the mental seething of the world from the 17th century of the Christian era onward. If the old world prophets are too rare and remote for our understanding, the modern revolutionaries are almost too gross and abundant for us to stand back and see them clearly. Vast studies have been organized of various portions of the field. Give, for instance, a picture of one wide area and period in which the fermentation arose first in a religious form and owed much to the clash of Jew and Gentile. While Malgrim's early forms of anarchism and socialism is a very successful attempt to realize the ideas and personalities from which the modern criticism of rule and property derived. With the help of such works as these, and with some luck among the biographies, we do contrive at trust to get down close to an imaginative participation in those individual reactions which in the aggregate the made the human community in the form we know today. Every one of these personal stories, if it were told completely, would have to begin with a child, taking the world for granted, believing its home, its daddy and mommy to be right and eternal. It confronted a fixed and established world with no standard of comparison in past or future. It was told its place in life and what it had to do. Bad luck, discomfort, some shock or some in innate unrest was needed to put a note of interrogation against these certainties. Then for those whom destiny has marked for disturbance comes the suspicion. This that they have told me isn't true. Still, more disturbing came the possibility. This that they do and want me to do isn't right. And then with a widening reference, things could be better than this. So the infected, infected individual drifted out of easy vulgar living with his fellows out of a natural animal-like acceptance of the established thing to join the fermenting and increasing minority of troubled minds that made trouble. He began talking to his fellows or he made notes in secret of his opinions. He asked awkward questions, he attempted little comments and ironies. We could conjure up hundreds of thousands of pictures of such doubters beginning to air their opinions in the 18th century world. In the little workshops of the time, in shabby, needy homes, in marketplaces, in village inns, daring to say something, hardly daring to say anything, unable often to join up the vague objections they were making into any orderly criticism, 
but in the brown libraries and studies of the period other men were sitting, poring over books, writing with something furtive in their manner, while the pride of contemporary life brayed and trumpeted along the roadway outside. What is being told to the people is not true. Things could be better than this. Men ventured on strange suggestions in university classes, brought out startlingly unorthodox theses. The infectious interrogation spread. Constituted authority got wind of these questionings and itself came questioning in search of heresy and sedition with luck and thumbscrew. When we read the books and pamphlets of that awakening phase, writings which seem amidst profuse apologies to half say next to nothing, we get the measure of the reasonable timidities of the time. Men might pay in sweating agony and death for that next to nothing they had said. At first, they read not so much the substance as the form of an interrogation. In the 16th century, you would have found a number of local accumulations of heresies, but hardly any inkling of the modern state. Except for some scholars echo to the Republic or Lords of Plato, there was no one at all reading and comparing in the field of social and political structure before the 17th century. The 18th century was, in comparison with its predecessor, an age of voluminous revolutionary thought. Men began calling fundamental ideas and political institutions in question, as they had never been challenged since the onset of Christianity. They went into exile for their innovations. Their books were burned, censorships were established to suppress these new ideas. Still, they spread and multiplied. The authoritative claim of aristocracy, the divinity of monarchy, tarnished, dwindled, became ineffective under these dripping notes of interrogation. Re republics appeared and the first embryonic intimations of socialism. In our account of the first French Revolution and the revolutionary perturbation of the 18th century, we have had to discriminate between the economic and social forces that were forcing political readjustment on the one hand and the influence of new ideas on the other. We have shown how little these formal changes were planned and how small a share in these events is to be ascribed to creative intention or mental processes generally. Nevertheless, the questioning was drawing closer to reality and the scope of the planning was spreading. We will not tell again of the profound change in men's ideas about private property, private freedom and monetary relationship that began to find expressions in the socialist and communist movements of the age. Our concern here is to emphasize the billions of small wrangles that were altering the collective thought to someone out of the past for an instant, an elfin clamor of now silenced voices that prepared the soil for revolution, the not at all lucid propagandists at street corners, the speakers in little meeting houses, in open spaces and during work intermissions to recall the rustle of queer newspapers that were not quite ordinary newspapers, and the handicapped book publications that were everywhere fighting traditional and instinctive resistances. Everywhere the leaven of the modern, modern state was working, confusing. As we have seen, the new conception of a single world society did not come at one blow, perfect and effective, into the human mind. It was not completed even in outline until the days of the wind, and before that time it was represented by a necessary confusion of contributory material, incomplete bits of it and illogical and misleading extensions of those bits. It had to begin like that, it had to begin in fragments and rashly. 
there was a, always a fierce disposition manifested to apply the new incomplete ideas headlong and violently. The more the sense of insufficiency gnaws at a man's secret consciousness, the more he is in conflict with an inner as well as an outer antagonist, the more emphatic, dogmatic, and final he is apt to be. That disposition to bring the new ideas to the test of reality, the urge to assert by experiment was the chief source of trouble for these ever-increasing multitudes of innovating minds. Constituted authority, established usage, have no quarrel with ideas as such. It is only when these ideas become incitation, when they sought incarnation in act and reality that conflict began. So all over the world throughout the 19th century men were to be found contriving trouble for authority and devising outrages on usage. The light of world reconstruction lit their souls but often it filtered through thick veils of misconception and had the colorings of some epidemic hate. They dreamt of insurrections, of seizures, of power, of organized terror. In practice, their efforts dwindled down too often to stupid little murders, often completely irrelevant murders, to shouting and swarming in the streets, to pelting and window breaking, to blowing in the front doors of government houses and embassies, to casting up explosives amidst the harmless spectators at public ceremonies. Before the French Revolution, there was not nearly so much of such sporadic violence as afterwards. There were a few assassinations by religious or racial fanatics, but usually the old type, older type of political crime was definitely connected with some conspiracy to change the personnel rather than the nature of a regime. The Anarchist outrages of the 19th century, however clumsy, were by comparison social criticisms. Behind them, even though vague, exaggerated and distorted, was the hope of a new world order. Linked inseparably with all these premature expressions of the desire for a new life were the activities of more extensive revolutionary systems, printing presses in cellars furtive distribution of papers, secret meetings, the savage discipline of fear ruled illegal societies, the going to and fro of emissaries, men often with narrow and ill-assorted minds, but nevertheless men with everything to lose and little to gain or hope for by such activities, after we have allowed for every sort of resentment and bitter impulse in them, the fact remains such men were devotees. They were a necessary ferment or for the spread of thought, that increasing revolutionary ferment in all its tentative aspects used to be called that the extreme left. There had never been anything quite like it, like it in the world before. For the most part, these men had broken not only with the political and social order of their time, but with its religious beliefs. Between 1788 and 1965, hundreds of thousands of men and thousands of women, far braver than any Muslim fanatics, sustained by no hope of a future life, no hope of any greeting after the sudden blankness of their untimely deaths, and so far as we can gather now, that even with a clear vision of the full and ordered social life for which they died, stood up suddenly or with a certain sad exhortation to face the firing party or the holder. A hundred times as many endured exile, prisons, ostracisms, beatings, gross humiliations, and the direst poverty for the still dimly apprehended cause of human liberation. They had not even the assurance of unanimity. They were all convinced that there had to be a better world, but they had not the knowledge, they had not the facilities for free and open discussion.
to clear up and work out the inevitable outline of their common need. They formulated their ideas dully and clumsily. They went a certain way to truth and then stopped short. They suspected all other formulae than the ones they themselves had hit upon. They quarreled endlessly, bitterly, murderously among themselves. Nearly all sooner or later were infected by hate. Often it happened that two men, each of whom had roughly half the justice of things in him, killed each other, when indeed they needed only to put their prepossessions together to get the full outline of a working reconstruction. The silver has called all those who made the revolutions and revolu revolutionary efforts that occurred between 1788 and 1948, the revolutionary revolutionaries of the half-light. His studies of the tangled history of the new social concepts that broke through to open popular discussion only after the establishment of the Soviet regime in Russia in 1917 constitutes a very brilliant work of elucidation and simplification. It is a history of twilight that ends at dawn. In the 20s and 30s of the 20th century, the ordinary man in the street was discussing, cheaply perhaps but freely, ideas, possibilities and causes of action that no one would have dared to whisper about, would scarcely have dared to think about, two centuries before. He scarcely knew a single name of the pioneers, fanatics, and desperados who had won this freedom for his mind. The nature of the conflict was changing, that was very plain by 1940, where there had been pioneers, there were now systematic explorers and surveyors. The teeming multitudes of our race were still producing devoted and sacrificial types, but the half-light was now a cloudy daylight, and the ordered analysis and plans of such men as the wind were making understandings and cooperations possible that would have been incredible in the 19th century. In the 19th century revolution was suspected, forbidden, dark, criminal, desperate and hysterical. In the 20th century it became candid and sympathetic. The difference was essentially an intellectual one. After a vast period of stormy disputation, the revolutionary idea had cleared up. The sun of the modern state broke through. Revolution still demanded its martyrs, but the martyrdoms were henceforth of a different character. Biographies of revolutionists before the Great War go on by night amidst a scenery of black streets, cellars, prisons, suspicions, and betrayals. Biographies of revolutionists in the final, st final struggle to establish the modern state go on in full daylight. It is reaction now which has taken to the darkness, to plots, assassinations, and illegal measures. The modern state pro propagandist became less and less like an insurgent individual of some alien subject race. He became more and more like a missionary in a savage country, ill-armed or unarmed, and at an immediate disadvantage, but with the remote, incalculable prestige of a coming power behind him. The later death roll of revolutionaries has fewer and fewer executions in it and an increasing tale of assassinations and death in public conflict. A larger and larger proportion of those who died for it were killed either by mobs or in fair and open fighting and soon the idea of the modern state had become so pervasive that the battles ceased to be for it or against it. They became rather misunderstandings between impatient zeros with the common end. In many conflicts, the historian is still perplexed to determine which side, if either, can be counted as fighting for the modern state. The analysis of the Bint made immense charities for charities of understanding possible, creative-minded men, 
though they hardened against the liar and the cheat, became less and less willing to fight the puerile adherent and the honest fanatic with a tiresome but honestly intended formula. There, they said, but for certain misconceptions and dissolvable obsessions, go our men and set themselves at any risk or loss to the task of conversion. Just as fascism in its time seized upon the ancient terroristic and blackmailing mafia in Sicily and partly annexed it, partly changed it and so superseded it, just as the Nazi movement incorporated large chunks of the Communist Party in its efforts to reformulate Germany. So now the modern state fellowship grappled with the worldwide series of organizations which had superseded democratic institutions nearly everywhere, made every effort to capture the imaginations of their adherents, and showed the most unscrupulous boldness in seizing their direction whenever it could. The modern state movement, different from every preceding revolutionary movement in its immense assimilatory power, due to the clearness of the objectives it set before men's mind. The difference between the revolutionary before the Great War and the revolutionary after that illuminating crisis is closely parallel to the difference between the old alchemist and the modern man of science. The former haunted by demons, goblins, and spirits, warped by symbolic obsessions and cabalistic words and numbers, terribly alone with himself, obsessed with religious fears, by fear of the inquisitor, by fear of the ruler above and of the rabble below, perpetually baffled in his attempts to achieve great things, but full of a dangerous and premediated knowledge of poisons and mischievous devices, the latter with a mind released by centuries of analysis and simplification, reassured by the incessant tale of scientific victories, stoically indifferent to popular misrepresentation and equally sure of his universe and himself. So uh, this is the entire section of the imaginary history book uh, presented in the shape of things to come by H.G. Wells. Yeah, actually, as I read, yeah, repeatedly reminded of some conventional imagination, which I believe we share. People in the past might be or should be underdeveloped, especially in the field of rationality or logical analysis. I think this yeah, idea called this a cheap assumption. Mankind, I assume, doesn't change so much as we imagine. So this um, a kind of kinder perspective on the past, what people li lived in the past. It's really important uh, in thinking about our attitudes towards our contemporaries. It's not separate issues, each other, thinking about already dead and thinking about contemporaries. These are connected with each other, I believe. So probably in next session I will talk and take much closer look at these passages I read today. Thank you for coming to my channel. Uh, I welcome anytime and uh, I hope mm, as many people as possible visit my 
channel and the playlist called towards a kinder society thank you very much see you bye bye